When I was 34, I had a great job as a sales rep. Making twice the money as I did the year before, I was spoiling my mother with expensive gifts, and I purchased a brand new blue sports car. One evening, standing in front of a closet full of expensive clothes and literally 150 pairs of shoes, but I didn't have a thing to wear. The outfit I was searching for couldn't be too conservative or too sexy. Now, I wish I could tell you I was getting ready for a really hot date. But the truth, I was looking for the perfect outfit to wear as I killed myself. Throwing clothes everywhere, screaming, I don't want to die. I'm broken and I need to be fixed. I remember the suicide highlight on TV and I reach for the phone again and again. And finally I dial. The man who answers is calming, gentle, and I feel safe. Whispering, I was sexually abused as a child for years and I've never told anyone. He allowed me to speak without interruption or judgment. And when I finished, he said, congratulations. I am proud of you and your courage to share your story. Congratulations? That's not what I expected to hear. They say your secrets make you sick. Mine was almost lethal. It's not stranger danger, as you may think. 93% of molesters abuse children that they know. It was my big brother who stole my innocence. Studies find that there are about 62,000 cases of child sexual abuse reported every year. But what is truly disturbing is that the experts agree that for every one report, two go unreported. The overall conclusion of that is that there are roughly 42 million adult survivors in the United States. You may be wondering why children and later adults don't tell. Well, there's good reason for this. After that phone call, I went into counseling. The ladies in the group were of all ages, status, and ethnicities. And sadly, the consequences of their telling were disastrous. I discovered some of my sister's survivors weren't believed. Many were blamed and then punished kicked out of their home, or forced to run away to escape, while the fathers, uncles, brothers, cousins, mothers, committing these atrocities were allowed to remain in the home. But when I told my mother, she was devastated, guilt-ridden. She understood why I was afraid to tell. She validated the strength it took to hide what I'd gone through. I never confronted him, she did, and he since passed. And I'm fortunate that my mother and other siblings, and later my husband, believed me. They listened to my story. They allowed me to speak, and they listened without interruption or judgment, and they supported me in getting help. It turns out this is an uncommon reaction. Now, I know it's difficult to hear stories about child sexual abuse. I get that. And I believe that most people who hear our stories want to be supportive. But another reason that victims don't share is the things that people say. And one way that happens is what Dr. Brene Brown terms uncomfortable sympathy. That's when somebody tells you something shocking like, uh, I've been sexually abused as a child, and you're not sure what to say. One common response, oh, you poor thing, well, just don't let your past define you. Over and over I hear, why don't you just get over it? You talk too much about it. You need to stop talking about it. You will hurt your business if people find out. I will never stop talking about it. Just ask my husband. Negative statements are really unconscious bullying. 
They may be well intended, but they, can, they make us feel unworthy of support and they contribute to our shame. I'm asked, why didn't you stop him? Why didn't you tell? But questions like that imply that the victim is responsible for stopping these crimes. He was the adult. I was only four years old. I had no language for what was happening. We didn't choose to be victims, but we are re-victimized when we are intimidated out of sharing. Conscious and unconscious bullying keep many survivors from telling, and many are too ashamed to seek help. Child sexual abuse going untreated can have devastating effects. Research shows that this hiding this horrible truth can cause chronic illness, devastating psychological, emotional, and sociological effects. Imagine your loved one hiding a horrible secret like that for almost 70 years. When I hired a friend to design the cover of my memoir, His Puppet No More, he was so excited. He shared the news with his mother. She sat silent for a few moments. With tears in her eyes, she whispered, that happened to me too. I was nine. It was my uncle's. Well, he was shocked, devastated. He didn't know what to say or do, so he hugged her and loved her and told her how much he loved her. The next time we spoke, I asked about his mother. And after she shared her secret, remember, to a loving, positive reaction, that gave her the courage to tell her family doctor who had been treating her migraines for years. At 86, She's smiling a lot more these days. And the best news is, her migraines have nearly disappeared. Yes. If we can't speak our truth, the pain is going to be released somewhere. Or we find coping mechanisms, such as drugs or a life of crime. Did you know that 84% of prison inmates have been abused as children? And 75% of women entering treatment programs report having been sexually abused. I was invited to speak at a women's prison, and the act of telling my story and others seemed to give those women permission to tell theirs. Crying, one inmate then another stood and shared her secret for the very first time. Doesn't it make you wonder what different path their life may have taken had they been encouraged to speak their truth before that day? I was given the opportunity to share my truth on Oprah and the world. It was one of the scariest things I have ever done. But I had to do it because I grew tired of being ashamed of a crime that I did not commit. And I am determined to be a voice for those who have not found theirs, because I know that remaining silent does not work. If healing begins by telling, then we must make telling safe. And you can help. What I believe first saved me from suicide and then kept me determined to get fixed is what I call the praise approach. What do you think would happen if we immediately offer praise and encouragement as survival, as, accompli as an accomplishment? Yes. yes. After speaking events, women and men come up in hushed voices and they share their secrets. So I began to test this process using positive statements, and the results have been astonishing. Not long ago, a young lady approached me whispering, that happened to me too. I listened, 
without interruption or judgment. And then I congratulated her courage and strength to persevere. <laughs> Clearly, that's not what she expected to hear. Wiping away her tears, she stood straighter and started smiling. Her last email, she's in counseling and on the way to recovery. It's imperative that you and I be aware of how we react and speak to survivors to encourage positive steps forward. It was hard to make that call years ago because I was taught that asking for help is a weakness. But that man on the phone assured me that there is nothing shameful about asking for help. He called me brave. And for the first time, instead of being ashamed, I was just a little bit proud of myself. He helped me reframe my beliefs. And as I studied the attributes of survival, I found that it highlights courage, strength, tenacity, perseverance. These are the successful coping strategies of resilient victims. If we can help survivors accept what has happened, help them be proud of their survival traits, help them focus on the strengths that help them persevere during and after what they've experienced, this can aid in the healing process. Now, the praise approach is not limited to use for child sexual abuse. Is there any unspoken shame living in you? A friend I confided in snapped, why don't you just get over it already? A month later, she found out her husband was having an affair. I knew that telling her to just get over it was not what she needed to hear. She was broken. She contemplated suicide. I listened without interruption or judgment, and I encouraged her to seek help. Feeling broken, suicidal, is not limited to the traumas of child sexual abuse. In my research, I discovered a philosophy that I show to those who feel broken, and it's called Genzuchi. Have you heard this? It's a Japanese art of repairing pottery with gold. Instead, it restores the object instead of discarding it, highlighting its flaws and making it even more val valuable. We must encourage these precious souls that they are not broken beyond repair. How you and I react and speak to survivors can make a difference in whether we shut down or get help. We use congratulations every day to express praise for an achievement. I think that you'll agree that the atrocities survivors have lived through is quite an achievement and worthy of praise. And just imagine this. If you and I make it safe to tell now, future generations of children will be spared from having these stories to tell.